Hi, good Tuesday morning. I'm Suzanne and I want to welcome you here again to Rogers Gardens for our live with Facebook and Instagram. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I've actually had a couple of people come up and tell me that they enjoy these videos. So from Sarah and I, thank you so, so much. We really, really appreciate all the feedback and all the questions and everything. This morning, we're going to be talking about what can I do with my herbs this month? Um, it's getting warm. It's pretty sunny here today. And um, we're just going to talk about some of the ways that maybe you don't think about using your herbs. And I love things like, we're going to start with this little lemon verbena. Uh, it looks so tiny and cute, but this can actually become almost a small tree in your garden. So it'll look really beautiful. It'll smell amazing. Oh, the leaves just are so beautiful and it has beautiful white flowers that are also super fragrant and the bees love it, but um, it's hard, hard to kind of show just how big it can get. I can show you, this is a one gallon container to kind of show you some of the potential, but um, these can become beautiful, beautiful trees kind of in the back. You can plant things around it. So don't just think of it as an herb that you can make tea with, the lemon verbena. You can do all sorts of beautiful things with it, but you can also use it just as a, a shrub in your garden. So I think um, this is fun. I actually have two of these in my garden and I love them. So with, with herbs, there are so many ways you can use them, again, not just as an herb, but in a landscaping thing. One of my favorites for kind of a little ground cover, just to either fill in among paving stones or just to have it spill out of a little bed to soften that edge is thyme. Um, thyme is so great. You can use it for so many different things and there are so many different kinds of thyme. So I'm gonna show you, first off, my just kind of one of my absolute favorites, this little creeping thyme. This is woolly thyme and it has a little soft kind of a feel to it, but it also, like most of the times, it's gonna bloom. It'll get blooms all over it. But as you can see, this will creep. It'll creep out of pots. It's super water wise. So you don't have to worry about keeping it too wet, like basil or something like that. And um, it will really fill in some little spots and like I said, just soften the edges of certain places that you might want to um, utilize it. And um, yes, you can eat it. It's probably not one of the most flavorful times, but in a pinch, sure, grab a, grab a little piece of it and use it to cook your dinner with. Some of the other times, so traditional, traditional times, English and French, this is pretty much what you use when you're cooking and you can put it in a salad dressing or you can throw it on your breakfast. You can throw it in your potatoes and cook them up. Um, this is just beautiful. Again, you can use it as a little fill-in ground cover and just have it be there in the garden, always ready so that you have a little time for a recipe. It's <laughs> really nice. Um, some of the other times that I just, I'm kind of fascinated with, this is called pizza time. I lost my little um, name tag on it, but I do know just from the look of it, this is called pizza time. So it is perfect for throwing on pizza or pasta or anything like that. It has a really, really good timey kind of flavor that goes really well with pizza. This is lime time. So there's lemon time, there's lime time. There are variegated lemon and lime times, but this is just, it has that citrusy, limey scent that is so pretty. It's a little bit lighter green. So again, in pots, just spilling out to fill some area. If you've got some flowers and things in there and you want to soften the edge of that pot, just throw some thyme in there. And it's, it's going to maybe last a little bit longer than most of the stuff in your pot. Here's some of that variegated. This is variegated lemon thyme and it's just gorgeous. I hope you all can see the little variegation on it. I wish we had smell -o vision right now, don't you? <laughs> it's, it's so gorgeous. We also have oregano. So this one got a little bit haggard while it was waiting for its moment <laughs> on Instagram and Facebook Live. This is golden oregano. It is really gorgeous. And um, given enough sun and just enough uh, regular watering, it'll spill out of a pot. It'll fill in some areas and it has that golden color almost all the time. Even the older leaves are very, very lime green. So it is fabulous. We have good old 
This is Italian oregano. So of course you can use this in your cooking, but it's a really pretty plant to put in pots, to throw on the ground. You can have all these things kind of interspersed with your other plants as long as you're using organic fertilizers and organic pesticides. You can use all of these for cooking while they're planted among your other plants. So it's really cool. We have Italian oregano, Greek oregano, columnar oregano, we have Mexican oregano. So each one tastes a little bit different, looks a little different. There are some other really beautiful ornamental um, oreganos that just bloom these really beautiful flowers. Some of the Dittany of Crete and things like that. They're really, really gorgeous and um, just make a nice accent th uh, plant for your garden. So try and think of them as little fillers, little ways to incorporate nice, beautiful, drought tolerant, water wise ground cover. This is uh, oregano, it's variegated. And so it's just really pretty. Again, in a pot as an accent piece, it is gorgeous. We have sage. Everybody loves sage, like around Thanksgiving. It's kind of like the one that everybody says, do we have sage? Gosh, well, if you had a plant, you would always have sage. And this is such a cool plant. This is traditional cooking sage. So culinary sage is bird garden. It's got the big, beautiful leaves. It's uh, pretty water wise wherever you put it. It might go a little bit scruffy in the winter, but um, if it's in a nice spot where it doesn't get too much water over the winter, it's going to come right back out. And in pots, it does great. And for the more ornamental and yet no less culinary, you have this variegated sage, which is really beautiful. It's just a, a version of that um, bird garden, but it's got this little yellow edge. There are purple uh, sages. There are all sorts of other culinary sages, not necessarily the sage flowers that have the beautiful, um, you know, the spike of flowers that the hummingbirds love so much. I have now this. Okay, so this is mint and everybody's familiar with mint, but I hope that everyone is also familiar with the fact that with mint, you never plant it in the ground unless you only want to have mint for the rest of your life. It is just not a plant that you want to put in the ground. It is very aggressive. It is very assertive and it loves to spread everywhere. So keep your mint in a pot all to itself. And if you want, you can get a nice little pot and put two or three mints in there. They might co-mingle, they might do whatever, but this is just a really good plant to have around to throw one leaf in your water, to put it in your watermelon salad, to put it in your tabbouleh salad, you know, just any way you want to cook with it. You can saute up things in the pan with a little olive oil, a little garlic, and a little mint. It's amazing. Uh, this is basil mint. And I think my, my one thing I want to mention is that there are a million kinds of mint. We have one, I can't remember if I grabbed it or not, I'll look. We have one that's actually called The Best. And so uh, there is no best mint. It's always what you want for whatever purpose. We have this beautiful English mint. So it's great for cooking. It's great for tea. The basil mint, I mean, think of all the different ways you could probably utilize that. But, hold on, sorry, I'm reaching around so much today. We have traditional peppermint and spearmint. And then this is mojito mint. Guess which one I like. Um, mojito mint is delicious, it's sweet, and it is perfect in a mocktail, a cocktail, in your water. You can make a cucumber salad with some onions and some of this mint in there. It's so refreshing and so great. Um, any of the mints are just gonna be a really good addition to your dish. And, um, Oh, we even have ginger mint. I mean, isn't that just, it's fascinating. We have chocolate mint, orange mint, so many different kinds of mints. And this, I can't decide if this is an herb or a vegetable or a plant, but I decided to kind of bring it with me today because I'm really fascinated right now with Moringa. I know a lot of people know about Moringa. A lot of people are taking Moringa as a supplement for whatever reason you might be but we have little Moringa plants and these will grow into a small tree as well. And uh, what you can do is, if you're not familiar with actually cooking Moringa, you want to boil, you know, take off a leaf um, or two or 5,000 and you're gonna boil them. 
or you know cook them in water until they're soft and then they're more easily digested um, but you can put them in your soup so um, you can put them fresh in the soup and as long as they cook through they're going to be easily digested um, you can also dry them and grind them up and put them in your smoothies and do whatever but um, moringa is a really really easy plant to grow it's just not a usually an easy plant to find and we've had a lot of customers asking for it so we're super happy and a ton of the people on the Hort team have all bought moringa plants and we're all talking about how big they are they grow very quickly and um, you can prune them back and um, it's kind of a cool thing to have in your garden to say I'm growing my own moringa so I really really like this and kind of the granddaddy of all herbs that people have in their garden is rosemary. And there are a ton of different kinds of rosemary. There is prostrate, which I don't think you can see, but it's right to my left over here. Prostrate grows like this. So it's a ground cover rosemary. Again, you can use it to fill in areas, but just keep in mind that it really grows a lot. So we're always uh, cautioning people when you want to have rosemary as a ground cover or as a fill-in thing, really be patient and plant it, you know, with a lot of distance in between the plants because they will grow together. And as a low, beautiful um, plant, it can still get like one, maybe even two feet tall. But if you want to keep it nice and low, plant just a few plants and let them slowly grow out. But the upright rosemary, uh, Tuscan blue, is kind of the classic that people like to have in their garden. It's a great hedge plant. It's a great shrub plant. You can kind of shape it and do whatever you like. It smells beautiful when you walk by it. And of course, you can use it for cooking by just going out, cutting a piece off, stripping it off the stem, and then using the, the leaves, and then maybe even using the stem as a skewer for if you're gonna be like barbecuing or something like that, you can put vegetables or whatever onto the skewer, and then you're gonna uh, cook it, and then it's gorgeous. Um, there are other varieties of rosemary that are upright. Um, there's a ton of different ones, and some of them look different, and some of them get taller, and some of them have more of a silvery underside to their leaves, but, um, we have some really nice culinary ones like Spice Island and one called Barbecue. And so um, those are a little bit more aromatic. And for people who might want to try and keep um, rabbits or um, other kind of little critters out of their garden, having aromatic plants like rosemary um, in, you know, as a kind of a border around their garden, it's going to help a lot because rabbits do not like rosemary. It's just too aromatic. I would say it's one of the few plants that you can pretty much guarantee that rabbits are not going to eat unless they're crazy rabbits. But um, for the most part, rabbits won't bother rosemary. They might hop over it to get to something that tastes better, but they won't eat it. So it's a great, great plant in so many different ways. And between cooking with it and just having it as, you know, your permanent aromatherapy <laughs> like this, it's really nice. It's, it's been so great just smelling all these right now. Um, so when you have your herbs, if you, you know, if you want to just have a herb, a little herb planter, my one recommendation is to like with like. So more water wise herbs in one container and more water thirsty herbs in another container. Water thirsty is basil and chives and coriander and things like that. And then more of the drought tolerant are pretty much the ones I spoke of today, except for the mint. The mint is usually likes a little more water, but it's pretty hard to kill. So uh, you can do that. And then think about using herbs in your garden to, to landscape, to have those herbs and also, you know, fill in a spot that you're thinking, oh, what can we put there? Oh, well, I cook all the time. Put a beautiful, you know, a big uh, Tuscan Beauty rosemary there, and you're always going to have that. You can also dry the herbs. And a lot of people do things like um, they chop them up and they freeze them. You can freeze them with olive oil. You can freeze them with water. You can... Um, make them ahead of time for a party if you want and have, you know, one little mint leaf in each ice cube and things like that to fancy up your whole spread. It's, you know, they're just really, really usable. And um, using the dried herbs is really fun, you know, to just have a whole little spice rack filled with your own homegrown herbs ready at your fingertips. So use this time now to 
cultivate your herbs, get them in there. There's not a lot of vegetables and things that you should be planting right now, but you can definitely work with the herbs. So with that, I'm going to ask Marissa if there are any questions. Yes, thank you, Suzanne. The first question is, pests start eating my herbs. What can I do to protect them and keep them edible? Herbs are delicious. I always tell people, <laughs> everybody wants to eat herbs. So it depends on which pest is eating it. Usually if it's a little worm or something, um, I know basil is always attacked by little worms because it's so delicious, because it's so tender. Basil leaves attract a lot of pests only because they're so tender. They're always fresh, juicy new leaves. Whereas like, you know, rosemary is a very aromatic, a very hard leaf for bugs to eat. Um, so I always recommend using BT. It's a great spray for um, keeping little green worms and things like that off of your herbs. We always tell people if you're one of the monarch people, of course, you're not going to get it anywhere near your milkweed, but um, for little green worms and things like that, BT is a great organic uh, product. All right. Is the moringa a perennial? Moringa is a perennial. It'll uh, sometimes lose its leaves a bit in the winter, but that's okay. It'll come right back. Um, this is Southern California, so I'm only speaking about Southern California. Other places, you'll probably have to bring it in if you have a really cool winter. Why does my rosemary have white spots on it? Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're going to... Uh, what do you say? A, a little warning here. Um, there is a gross little bug that loves to get on rosemary and it's called spittle bug. If it, if the white spots that you're talking about, there's two different things. So one could be mites and those are actual spots on the leaves and mites you're going to try and use an oil-based spray to get it. Also spray your rosemary off once a week with a hose, blast it off, get that environmental dust and dirt off of it because that gives uh, mites and other bugs a place to just kind of sit and really feel comfortable. Um, another thing that rosemary gets is spittle bug. So spittle bug is pretty much what it sounds like. It looks like someone has spit all over your rosemary. And it's kind of gross, but it's pretty easily identified. It, it will kind of be on the stems and um, it just looks like kind of foamy, foamy soapy stuff. So maybe we'll call it soapy bug. Um, it's it is easily uh, taken care of with an insecticidal soap. So you just want to spray it on there and make sure that you do it um, once a week uh, for three or four weeks. Or you can even use a product like Takedown, which is uh, a pesticide that will kill the eggs, the larvae, and the adults. But a spittlebug, keep that plant clean and make sure that you use your organic product regularly to uh, make sure that you're also dealing with eggs that might still be there. All right. My mint never seems to thrive and it's full of bugs. Any, any advice? <laughs> mint thriving, but full of bugs. Mint is delicious also. So maybe use a little BT. I would say maybe, um, I'm not sure if it's not thriving because you might be overwatering or underwatering, but mint does like a little sun. Um, it can survive in shade. It's, it's okay. Not full shade, but you know, some shade, you want to fertilize it and you definitely want to, um, you know, it'll, it'll kind of die back in the winter and then it's going to come back out in the spring. And so just make sure you're using an all purpose fertilizer on it and keeping that soil kind of lightly moist, not, not too wet. All right. What her herbs can I grow inside without a lot of sun? Herbs inside without a lot of sun. It's funny because we were joking the other day that in England they say herbs and here we say herbs. Yeah. So each way is, is correct. Um, inside, I think basil is such a great one to grow inside because you don't have the bugs attacking it. As long as you've got a nice light window where it gets, you know, a reasonable amount of kind of heat and a little, not maybe that direct sun coming in because it could burn it going through the window, but a nice light window, basil does great. Chives do great. Um, even a mint inside could do great. I would say rosemary, not great inside. Um, some of the more drought tolerant water wise plants, maybe not so much inside, but uh, coriander, cilantro do well inside. So kind of like those tender leafy ones, um, those will do really well. What is BT? BT. BT is, oh, I'm going to probably mangle the name, but it's Bacillus thurnbergis or something. It's a bacteria. That's what it is. It's a bacteria and it goes onto the plant 
And um, what happens is, depending on the age of the worm or caterpillar that are eating it, it does different things to its insides. Um, but it is, it's just a bacteria, and it's very specific to worms and caterpillars. Okay, that seems to be all the questions for today, Suzanne. Thank cool. you. Thank you, Marissa. <laughs> um, so that's it for today. Don't forget that uh, Thursday we've got Sarah here with the plant of the week. I've got a bee friend buzzing me. Um, uh, thank you so much. We have rogersgardens.com where you can shop online or come on into the store. We're open every day, nine to six. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, and we have our YouTube channel where you can look up all of our informative instructional videos. So that's about it for me today. We'll see you next week. Next week is going to be really good, by the way. Next week is going to be like one of my favorite subjects. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> that's it.